Welcome to the Bradenton Times Candidate Focus 2010. In the interest of informing voters, we've invited all local candidates to come on and discuss the major issues in their race. While not all candidates were able to participate and others chose not to, each candidate was invited and afforded the opportunity to speak. Our interviews today do not imply any endorsement of candidates or specific viewpoints, but are merely intended to provide information to the public. Joining me now is James T. Golden, the Democratic candidate for Florida's 13th Congressional District. He'll be running against the incumbent Republican Vern Buchanan. And uh, Mr. Golden, thanks for being with us today. How are you? Thank you, Mr. Miles, for inviting me. And I'm really glad to have this opportunity uh, to uh, talk with you and to provide more information uh, to the voters of the 13th Congressional District. I know you've been here relatively recently. Uh, you did a debate with uh, your opponent, so this is a little more relaxed, so you don't have to worry about uh, timing or anything. We'll, we'll, we'll let you talk. That's fine. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I had asked uh, uh, by letter of Mr. Buchanan's campaign for three debates, and uh, so far we've only had the one, and the prospects for others uh, looks pretty, pretty dim. Before we get into the, the campaign itself, let's give a little background about yourself. I mean, you grew up in, in Florida, I believe Jacksonville you were born in? Or? I was born in Jacksonville, but uh, I grew up in Daytona Beach. Daytona Beach, right. And uh, I've lived in Florida all of my life except to go away to school and to, to go into the military. Mm -hmm. um, I went to the University of Florida Law School, um, uh, partly on the GI Bill. I'm um, a Vietnam-era veteran. Um, I spent 13 months in Korea. Um, I graduated from Stetson University, uh, the School of Business. You're a hatter. Uh, yes, yes, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, among a gator, a hatter. Uh, many, of many uh, acronym names. Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> Two good schools. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I really uh, am very happy about my experience at the University of Florida Law School. Uh, uh, I meet and greet a lot of people that I've known since law school, uh, as in various parts of the state. I worked as a city councilman for eight years and came into contact with a lot of people that I happen to have been in, in law school with. I worked with the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. And again, the same, same kind of setting, uh, meeting people uh, that I've known down through the years who are also involved in uh, public service. Now, you've made a career change, obviously, as a lawyer for, for many years, but uh, then you went into the ministry. That, that, that must have been an interesting time of your life. Well, it, it, it's not so much a career change as a career supplement. I still practice law, mm -hmm. uh, but um, I'm not quite so sure whether I could be characterized as an attorney who is also a minister as much as a minister who also has a legal background. Right. Um, I, I think that... Uh, the focus and emphasis in terms of the way I have chosen to live uh, is on service. Uh, and um, I suspect that uh, that would be more akin to the ministerial side mm -hmm. of uh, my uh, capabilities as opposed to the, to the legal side. It's not that lawyers don't serve. But uh, usually there's a fee involved yes. and uh, <laughs> uh, compensation and consideration. But uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, no, not nothing. But there, there's not there's nothing quite as satisfactory as uh, being able to help somebody and seeing how it impacts them. There's there's nothing that pays off like that. Now you were a pastor of a church in Bradenton for, for many yes, years, I'm, so obviously uh, you've seen. A lot of people come to you with problems for counseling. That has to give you some kind of uh, in, insight into uh, into running as a as a candidate, doesn't it? Very, very much so. I, I am um, a Methodist uh, minister uh, in the uh, uh, Wesleyan tradition, uh, as well as in the uh, uh, Allen uh, tradition. Uh, the founder of this particular branch of Methodism that I'm I'm in. Hmm. What uh, what was the impetus for having you? decided to run particularly this year against uh, Vern Buchanan. Any one particular thing that caused to do it? Um, I, I wish I could say that there was a straw that broke the camel's back or that there was some particular instance that uh, proved to be revelatory or, or some type of epiphany. But I think that it was just the continual uh, watching uh, at how the change that America so unequivocally uh, made in 2008, how the resistance uh, to that change has just 
built and built and built to where it literally has the country gridlocked. And I think that somebody just needs to say enough is enough. The change that we saw in 2008 was good, we meant it, and we only want to progress. Mm -hmm. So you're either a part of the problem or you're a part of the progress. And I have just concluded from the many no votes that Mr. Buchanan has cast, uh, voted no against uh, the Lilly Ledbetter Act, uh, voted no against the extension of uh, benefits for home buyers, first time home buyers, uh, voted no to the stimulus packages, voted no uh, to lending uh, to small businesses, voted no to, it's just a, a litany of no, 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 no. And um, I just don't believe that you can make progress just by saying no. I don't even believe you can maintain the status quo just by saying no. I think that uh, no simply uh, prolongs the need to do something. Uh, if, if you're in a ditch, uh, just saying no doesn't get you out of the ditch. Right. Uh, you don't want a, a rope, you don't want a harness, you don't want a tow truck, you, you just no, 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 no. And the longer you say no, the longer you stay in the ditch. Mm -hmm. And so I think that kind that of attitude is what attitude put you in the race then. Just put me in the race. Yeah. Before we get to some of the issues, uh, you mentioned uh, the change in 2008. You had an opportunity to be a delegate, didn't you, at the uh, well, 2008 convention? Uh, as a matter of fact, I was a delegate at the 2004 convention, but I was an elector. Elector, that's right. In the yeah. 2008, I was. You're uh, one of those people you know, that we actually vote for, and you actually do the electing. On, that is uh, correct. When do they do that? Is that January uh, 1st? It was. Um, no, it was early December. December they did that, that we all yeah. assembled up in. Uh, Tallahassee. There was a time after the uh, election day when the votes were all ratified uh, and certified, and then the electors who have been elected by their respective parties come and cast the votes as a part of the electoral college, yeah. and it's done all over the country on the same day. There are people when they vote for president aren't actually voting for the president, voting for the electors of the president, and you're one of them. That must have been a nice honor for you. Yeah, more accurately, the, the people are um, engaged in a popular election uh, for the president, right. but they are not involved in an election countrywide. The election is statewide. State by state. By sure. state by state. And that makes a, a, a big difference eh? because shortly after the election there was a great hue and cry in terms of, well, we ought to do away with the Electoral College as if the Electoral College is the, the homogeneous unit that elects the president. The Electoral College is just that homogeneous unit that expresses the will right. of the people in the states. Well, 10 years ago we saw how it made an impact, right? That's right. Whether and you agree with it or not, it, it made an impact. It, it makes an impact. <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, what's good for the goose, I suppose, is good for the gander. And these things tend to even out over the, uh, over the course of our, our, our national history. Let's do, move on to some of the, uh, the issues. Uh, obviously, health care reform. President Obama has, uh, has passed some reform uh, in health care. And I know as a congressman, potential congressman, you're going to be part of that uh, debate, continuing debate. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And I suppose uh, for as long as we have the opportunity to converse as much as I possibly can, I would simply like to contrast uh, the views that I have with the views as espoused by uh, Mr. Buchanan. Sure, that's right. uh, first and foremost, uh, I did support and I do support uh, the efforts at health care uh, reform. Uh, Mr. Buchanan voted no uh, against the efforts that we've made uh, so far. Uh, he is also on record uh, as co-sponsoring uh, health care uh, legislation that is designed to repeal the health care legislation uh, that has already been uh, uh, voted on uh, by Congress. So he's now preparing to go back to vote yes to repeal what was voted on when he was there last time uh, that he voted no against. Mm -hmm. um, the, the problem that I have with that is that in this so-called uh, pledge to America that uh, Mr. Buchanan's party is advocating in terms of what they would like to see in a health care bill, 
every provision in that pledge is already in the law as it presently exists. And not to mention the fact there are many provisions of the current law that have not even taken effect and many provisions that have taken effect that have not made an impact yet. And so, yes, I look forward to being a congressman that's a part of the process of making progress from where we are and not continuing to just revert and go back and continue to try to get to the future by going to the past. Now, what would you say, the, the opponents of not only that bill, but uh, the, the massive spending that's been done uh, the last a couple of years by Congress, uh, do you think it's uh, too much spending, or what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, let me share that. First of all, Congress didn't just start spending two years ago, and, and my, my 82-year-old mother, I think, put this in, in, in perspective for me, and I'd like to tell you a story. Sure. She said that when she and my dad bought their home uh, many, many, many years ago, they had no equity. It was all deficit. Yeah. <laughs> it was all debt. And, uh, but they kept paying on it. They, they kept working at it. They, they loved their home. They, they kept it painted. They kept the yard uh, done, they, the windows washed. And, and eventually, uh, it began to be the kind of home that they wanted. But when the children got old enough and it was time for us to go to school or time for us to get braces or when there was an emergency situation when somebody went into the hospital, they borrowed against the house. And I, I can see the similarity here in that, yes, we've borrowed against our home. America is our home. It doesn't belong to the big sister who lives upstairs in the room or to the little brother who lives in the basement. It's all of our homes. And so we have borrowed against it and we now owe more on it than we would like to owe. But nobody is talking about abandoning the home. Nobody is talking about not working to improve the home. Nobody is not talking about getting out of debt. We want to do that. It's just going to take more time now than we may have thought it would have taken, let's say, 10 years ago when the tax cuts that we are now arguing about were first enacted, or even two years ago when we were all full of enthusiasm about the future and nobody knew the extent or the depth of the problems that we were experiencing. But nobody needs to be afraid of the future. We all need to be moving toward a future that we will embrace because it's no different than what is now our past that once was our future that we've always, as Americans, sought to reach out to and to be better about and to do for one another. And, 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 and I, I think that, that you know, when we talk about spending, of course you spend. And nobody would like to spend more than they have to, but there's not one among us that not, would not spend what it takes to get the job done. And nobody is afraid to take care of their own. Nobody's afraid to take care of their home. This is our home. So we shouldn't be trying to scare each other about how much money it takes to take care of it. That, that's like my dad telling my mother, boy, this is really bad. You should be afraid. No, we are in this together. Now, is there a limit, though, on the borrowing? I think a lot of people are concerned about, well, if you keep no, borrowing, eventually yeah. you have to pay it back. And, 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 and that's, a fair, that's a fair statement. But, but we ought not to be afraid of borrowing. Now, if you want to talk about the limits to which we borrow, that's a fair question, and that it involves more than just the amount that you borrow. It's what you borrow for. I, I, following the analogy that I just gave you, my mother and father borrowed uh, for medical expenses. They borrowed for our college expenses. They didn't borrow money to go on vacation. And they didn't borrow money to, to, to go and have a good time. And so, likewise, maybe we do need to give some serious thought to whether we need to continue spending as much money as we do on foreign wars. Maybe diplomacy is a more economical way to try to bring about the change we'd like to see in the world. Maybe we don't need to be spending as much uh, as we need to be spending shipping our jobs overseas and giving an imbalance of trade that we need to correct. 
Maybe we do need to stop scaring our senior citizens by telling them that we're going to privatize their Social Security. So, so when you talk about spending, I don't think you can separate that from what are you spending money for. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, I'm just afraid, the only thing that I'm afraid of is that we got too many people telling us what all we need to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. And when I heard this was a country where we didn't have anything to fear but fear itself. FDR said that. Yes, he did. Yeah. Yes, That's even did. before your time. You weren't around then. Well, I'm not quite so sure. <laughs> I was born in 47. Well, you don't have to tell your age. Yeah. <laughs> well, how about you mentioned the tax cuts. Uh, in your opinion, should they be extended? I think that they should be extended as it relates to people earning $250,000 or less, but not for people earning $250,000 or more. Uh, the prevailing logic that you hear from uh, um, the incumbent and from those of his party is that if we need to leave that hand, that money in the hands of those people so that they can then go out and invest it and do things and provide jobs and provide the, uh, the boost that we need for the economy. Well, to that I simply ask, where have they been for the last 10 years? And what have they been doing with the money that they have been accumulating for the last 10 years? And I think that reality shows us that when these tax cuts went into effect under the Bush administration, those people were receiving these benefits. Unemployment continued to climb. The jobs continued to go offshore. Uh, the economic development that we need did not uh, come about. The energy uh, uh, the dependence that we have on foreign oil increased. So if, if, if these people have not done this in the last 10 or 12 years that they've had the tax cuts, why not eliminate the tax cuts for them and put it in the hands of, uh, of a government that is committed to stimulating the economy, that is committed to revitalizing the infrastructure, that is committed to trying to bring some of those jobs overseas back home? All right. What, what could you do uh, should you become the, the congressman uh, specifically uh, for creating jobs? I mean, it's a very difficult, I know, multitask, multi-leveled question, but, but what can you do uh, immediately in your opinion, Mr. Golden? Well, um, immediately here in the 13th Congressional District, uh, as would be in every district, but what I think makes it salient for us is that there are some parts of our country that add to uh, the unemployment rate, and there are some parts of our country that are below the average. So if, if it's an average that you're trying to, to reduce, I think we begin with helping those parts of the country that contribute to the average being as high as it is. The 13th Congressional District is one of those. And so if we don't have uh, the business foundation here that we'd like to have. Uh, several of our local governments are doing more and more to entice business to come here mm -hmm. with their internet efforts and doing things in terms of waiving various impact fees and what have you. If it's not here until it gets here, then I suppose that this ought to be one of the districts where we can maximize the federal funding that comes in that's made available to employers who are about retraining their employees, to schools that are doing uh, joint uh, ventures with, them, uh, with schools and employers, uh, to do the kinds of things that we need to bring more money into the area. I'd like to see the infrastructure project that has been approved already from Orlando to Tampa in terms of rail extend from Tampa to Fort Myers. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to, to hurry up and do something about that before our neighbors to the north in Pinellas County convince the powers that be that you ought to just go ahead and put a rail bridge across Tampa Bay right next to the Franklin, G. Franklin, Howard Howard Franklin Bridge. Howard Franklin yeah. bridge. I, I don't think that it's realistic to think that you're going to have one going uh, a high-speed rail going over into St. Pete and still have the kind of resources that we'd like to have to go down in uh, all the way to Fort Myers. And I, I think that when you go through uh, Manatee, Sarasota, DeSoto, uh, Lee counties, you're impacting a lot of people, a lot of jobs, you, you, you're creating new infrastructure and you're helping a lot more people than you would be by simply extending high-speed rail from Tampa to St. Right. Petersburg.
So those are the kinds of things. I'm looking at our port here. It's a wonderful facility. Port Manatee. Port Manatee. Yes. It's a wonderful facility. But I think it's, it, it could be used more than just for commercial uh, uh, uses. If we get that rail going all the way down to Fort Myers, people could, by boat, come into here and instead of going northeast over to Walt Disney World and to Bush Gardens, go south. Mm -hmm. And enjoy our beautiful beaches and the pristine so beaches. More of a shipping uh, industry, is that what you mean? Or? Uh, more, uh, not just commercial, but more retail shipping. Retail shipping. Yeah, more, more uh, tourists, more tourism, make, make our port a tourist destination mm -hmm. also. Cruises, you're talking yes, about. Yes, okay. that's correct. Yeah. Which can be done. We have a deep water port. We can do these things, mm -hmm. but only if we collaborate, only if we cooperate with each other. Obviously, no secret to you, uh, Mr. Golden, it's been a Republican district for, for many years now. It is a bit of an uphill battle. I mean, I think you could concede that, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, are you confident going into this? It, it, it's, it's difficult to, to get a district to, to change parties, though. Well, let me share with you what I think. I think it used to be a Republican district. I think at one time it may have even used to be a Democratic district. Right now, what I think it is, it is a, it is a district in distress. And I think that uh, as I look at the people who are distressed, as I look at the foreclosures around us, as I look at the unemployment that, are, that surrounds us, as I look at the Social Security recipients who are concerned about their Medicare benefits being unstable, I find it very hard to detect which ones are Democrats and which ones are Republicans. Mm -hmm. I, I think that everybody is a little sick and tired of being frightened without having any solutions being proposed. I think everybody is a little uh, sick and tired of just being told nothing can be done uh, or pointing fingers at uh, the other fellow. I'm not here to point fingers at Mr. Buchanan. I'm here simply to say to the people who are watching that we can do better together than we'll ever be able to do separately and that the representation that we've had up until this point has not been for all of us. If Mr. Buchanan voted against equal pay for women, if he voted against helping students with the loan, if he voted against first-time home buyers, if he, if, he, if he is for privatization of Social Security, and all of these are things are, that are on record, then who in the 13th Congressional District is he representing? We just have about a minute left, uh, Mr. Golden, uh, if you'd like to just address the camera and uh, tell the voters uh, a final comment before we wrap up. This is an opportunity for the entire country uh, to make a statement in terms of the direction in which uh, we are heading. We made a major shift in the way we asked and the way that we are allowing ourselves to be governed uh, two years ago. Since that time, we have made progress in terms of what we said we wanted. Uh, we want to rein in reckless government spending. We want to stop uh, the flow of American blood on foreign soils for oil and for the vested interest of special interests. We want our country to be once more and again what we said it would be in the beginning. We the people, for the people, of the people, by the people. I would like to be one of the citizen representatives that's sent by the citizens of the 13th Congressional District, not just to make the 13th Congressional District a better place to work and live, but to make our country a better place to work and live, and not just for today, but for our future. James Gold, appreciate you joining us today. Good luck to you, and we'll talk you. to you down the road. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for joining us for the Brandon Times Candidate Focus 20, 2010. We'd like to thank all of our participating candidates and remind viewers that although some candidates could not or chose not to participate in this series, all were invited. The Brandon Times and METV do not endorse any specific candidates or views, but we do encourage you to get out there and vote on November 2nd. I'm Doug Miles for the Brandon Times. Thanks for watching.